Well, recently in this environment, Jeff Martins confessed to not ever having watched a single Star Wars movie until he was in his mid-30s. And worse, when he did, he started with episode one. I mean, while I can't uh, condone this level of personal negligence, what I can appreciate is how confusing the Star Wars movie order is to the uninitiated. I mean, I was born in 1977, the year the first movie came out, which is called, confusingly, episode four. But if you start watching from episode four, you eventually get to a very dramatic scene in the movie. It's the climax of the entire saga, where we, as the audience, together with Luke Skywalker, learn that Darth Vader is, spoiler alert, Luke's father. It's all very exciting. But if you watch the series, as Jeff Martins did, starting with episode one, which is actually just a backstory on the original movies, you actually spend three movies watching Luke's father, Anakin Skywalker, become Darth Vader. And so by the time you get to this dramatic scene, the big reveal is no big deal. You already knew. I mean, it's a completely different experience. You know, for the first group, the original group of movie watchers, Star Wars is a story about a young Jedi named Luke Skywalker who learns the Force and then takes on the ultimate supervillain, Darth Vader, and turns him good. But for the next generation that watched the series starting with Episode One, Star Wars is a story about Anakin Skywalker, a, a child who is discovered and raised in the Force until he's seduced by the dark side and becomes Darth Vader until he is... Uh, redeemed and saved by the unflinching love of the son he never knew he had. I mean, it's two completely different stories just because you started in a different place. And that's the thing. Sometimes a story can have a completely different meaning, even significantly, just because of where you start from. And that's the case with the passage that we're going to look at today, the one that was already read for us. You know, as we continue in our look at the seven I am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John, we come to perhaps the most well-known of them, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, this statement is the climax of this passage and perhaps of all of Jesus' teaching, and its meaning seems clear. I mean, Jesus is comforting his disciples, saying, you know, don't worry, I know life is hard, but if you believe in God and believe in me, there will be a place waiting for you in heaven when you die. You know, I know that we suffer in this life, but my father, God, has a house called heaven with many rooms, which the King James Bible called mansions. Um, and if you just hold on to the faith, I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you to your mansion in the sky when you die. But be warned, there's only one way to get there. Now, a confused disciple asks, Jesus, we don't even know where you're going. How do we know the way? This is the central question of this passage. Now, where is Jesus going and how do we follow him there? And to this question, Jesus responds with one of the most definitive statements in all of Scripture, saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is offering exclusive access to heaven, you know, freedom from, for eternity from suffering and sorrow, a life of endless bliss, complete with our own personal, customized mansion designed and built by the divine carpenter himself, Jesus. You know, this is a passage that has brought comfort and hope to many. Um, it's often read at funerals or used to settle religious debates. It's caused countless to raise their hand, walk the aisle, or pray a prayer to become Christian. Its message is as simple as it is profound. Jesus is the only way to heaven. In preparation for today, I've listened to dozens of sermons. I've read a pile of commentaries, and almost all of them agree that this is what Jesus is saying. The problem is, I'm not convinced that that's what Jesus is saying at all. 
Now, the problem for me isn't that I'm swayed by a culture that finds the exclusive claims of Jesus uh, uncomfortable or even downright offensive. Um, I actually began this series that we're in by talking about how Jesus is the perfect representation of who God is as, you know, Yahweh, the great I am, because Jesus and God are one and the same. You know, and it's not that uh, I struggle to believe in the chapter and verse inspiration of Scripture. It's just that I don't really believe in chapters and verses. What I mean is, Jesus didn't speak in chapters or verses. And when John wrote this gospel, he didn't use them either. See, the chapters in our Bible were added more than a thousand years later in 1221 by a university professor named Stephen Langton. And the verses were added more than 300 later, years later than that by a print shop owner named Robert Stephanus. Now, Stephanus and Langton, they added the chapters and verses to make it easier for us to find things in the Bible, which is great, uh, but sometimes they can actually create confusion, causing us to look at different chapters as being unrelated, even when, as is the case here, multiple chapters span one single conversation. See, I believe that the conversation that we were eavesdropping in when we read the passage earlier actually begins a bit earlier still. And like watching Star Wars, where you start listening in from can completely change the meaning of what Jesus is saying. And so I want to invite you to back up just a little bit with me to what Stephen Langton called chapter 13 and what Robert Stephanus called verse 31, where the conversation actually begins. Now, while you're flipping back in your Bibles, um, chapter 13 uh, tells the story of what we often call the Last Supper, where Jesus gathered with his disciples to have a meal on the night before he was crucified. At that meal, he predicted his own death, and he created a brand new practice uh, called communion, where they ate bread and drank wine, symbolic of the death Jesus was about to die, something we still do today. And then Jesus identifies Judas as the person who is going to betray him. Now, as Judas leaves the group and heads off into the night to, to do his dirty work, Jesus turns to his remaining disciples. And in, in John chapter 13, verse 31, he says that when he, Judas, was gone, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you that before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Now, doesn't that clear everything up? There's actually a lot to decode here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do my best. But Jesus begins by talking about being glorified by God and God being glorified in him. And here's what you need to know. In the Gospel of John, the glorification of Christ is a euphemism. It's, it's kind of code language for John to talk about the cross. You know, the cross is where the glory of God, God's unblemished, perfect love is put on display in Jesus. That's what he's talking about. Um, for example, this is kind of a theme throughout John. You know, for example, just only a chapter earlier in, in uh, John chapter 12, Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth on the cross, will draw all people to myself. And just in case it wasn't clear, John adds, he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is what we need to understand is that whenever John is talking about Jesus being glorified in his gospel, 
It's talking about the crucifixion. Now, with this grim subject matter in the air, um, and with Jesus having predicted his own death, with the taste of communion still on their tongues, and the door still swinging behind Judas as he's gone off to betray Jesus, Jesus warns his friends that he's about to leave them. He says, I'm, I'm about to die. I'm going to leave you, he says. And where I am going, you cannot come. You recognize that language bells should be going off for us. This is the central question, remember, that we read in John chapter 14. Where is Jesus going and how do we follow? Jesus says, where I am going, you cannot come. Now in chapter 14, it seemed like Jesus was going to heaven to get it ready for us. But here in chapter 13, it's pretty obvious that where Jesus is going is the cross. Now, On the heels of this statement, Jesus issues his disciples a brand new commandment. He says that they are to love one another as I have loved you. Now, the thing that we need to appreciate here is that there were already plenty of commandments uh, about loving each other. Uh, Most well-known would be Leviticus 19 verse 18, which says that we're to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. See, what was new about this commandment wasn't that we're to love one another, but how we're to love one another. Not just as we love ourselves, which is still so imperfectly, but as Christ has loved us. This is another major theme in John's gospel, the way that God's love is demonstrated in the sacrificial life of Jesus. From John 3, 16's, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, To Jesus later saying that no greater love has anyone than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. See, for Jesus, love is not just a happy feeling. It is hard, um, sacrificial, selfless, self-giving action on behalf of another person. This kind of cross-shaped love is the core ethic and central mission of the church and as our leader, that's why Jesus was going to the cross to lead the way in love. Now, Peter returns uh, to the central question and he says, um, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replies, he says, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Now, this is one of two times in John's gospel that he actually hints at the the ultimate death that Peter is going to die, that Peter was also going to be crucified like Jesus for his allegiance to Jesus. This would have been an event that had already taken place by the time John wrote this gospel. And so to his original readers, um, it would have been just clear as day that Jesus was talking about crucifixion. And Peter, um, perhaps catching on, turns to Jesus and says, okay, well, I'm ready to lay my life down for you. Sadly, um, despite his enthusiasm, Peter is going to learn that it will have to be the other way around. In fact, Peter will, before the night is over, deny even knowing Jesus. It's a grim conversation and... You know, with all of this hanging in the air and this talk of death and Judas has already abandoned them and it seems like Peter's about to fall away as well. Jesus knows the, the trauma of the events that are about to unfold for his friends and he cares about them so much. And so without turning the page or starting a whole new chapter, he looks at them with comfort in his heart for them and he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. Now this word believe isn't the way we think of the word believing, like, you know, believing in Santa Claus, whether he exists or not. This isn't an intellectual or logic word. It's a relational word. It's more like the word trust. Jesus is saying, trust me. Trust me. I know that you're worried. I know that you're afraid, but you can trust me. You know, he's not trying to comfort them or reassure them with promises of some disembodied future in heaven, uh, a word that actually does not appear in this text, by the way. 
He's not trying to distract them with promises of mansions, which as an aside, can we just, I mean, does it make sense to any of us that um, an eternity of material wealth and luxury would be the grand prize for following Jesus? Someone who spoke about nothing more than resisting the temptation of material wealth and greed? I mean, just think about it. It doesn't really make sense to me. See, Jesus isn't promising them mansions. He's trying to offer them meaning. He's trying to let them know that what they're about to experience, where he's going to the cross, is part of a plan. Now, as he continues, um, I, I need to explain a little bit about verse 2, especially for any of us like me who were, who were raised in the church. It's almost impossible for us to hear the words of verse 2 and not be thinking about heaven. Um, but Jesus says, you know, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? For starters, when Jesus talks about my father's house, the word house here is the Greek word oikos, you know, just like the yogurt. And uh, while the word oikos can be used to describe like a, a, a domestic residence, um, every time Jesus uses it in the Gospel of John, it's translated more like family or household. It's a much bigger word than just, you know, a brick and mortar building. You know, it's kind of like if you're a Harry Potter fan, the house of Gryffindor isn't a, a building. It's just a community to which you belong. See, God doesn't live in a house called heaven. Jesus is talking about the family and household of God, a, a home that has room for everyone. This word room that Jesus uses is the Greek word monai, and it's only ever used one other time in the entire New Testament. And actually, it's just a, a couple of short sentences later here in John chapter 14, where Jesus talks about how the, by the Holy Spirit, God is going to come and dwell with us. It's a, a better translation of the word. It's just dwelling. This is how Jesus uses the word monai in John to talk about the way that God is going to dwell with us and we are going to dwell with God, not in some disembodied celestial palace in the sky called heaven, but here on earth in this lifetime. And when Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, um, the word place here is the word topan, which is the kind of word that we would use when making a place for somebody uh, in our community or giving someone a place at the table of leadership. Um, this is a word uh, that elsewhere in scripture is translated as opportunity or possibility. That's the way we find our place in this world. Jesus isn't going to heaven to make mansions for us. He's going to the cross to make room for us, to create the opportunity and possibility that every single one of us could find our true identity and sense of belonging in the family and household of God. And when he says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back, he's not talking about some distant future second coming of Jesus. He's talking about the resurrection something he has already talked to his disciples about and that will actually give them comfort and courage in this moment. He's saying, when I am resurrected, I'm going to come back and I'm going to bring you to heaven. No, he says, I'm going to come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. I mean, Jesus is borrowing from first century Jewish wedding tradition language here, where the groom would go and build an addition, a room on the side of his father's ancestral home. And when everything was ready, he would go and get the bride and bring her to be there. And they would live together under one roof with the whole family together. Um, Jesus isn't trying to whisk us off to heaven. He's trying to sweep us off our feet in a match made not in heaven but on the cross where God's love is put on full display and Jesus creates the opportunity and potential for every single one of us to come together um, as bride and groom, the church and Jesus. See, Jesus didn't come to solve the problem of life on earth. He came to restore life on earth, to reintroduce us to our heavenly father and reintegrate us into the household 
of God. And so when the disciples say, you know, where are you going? We don't know the way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, a few years ago, uh, I went to a retreat with some of our staff. And um, after some meetings, we were going to go out for dinner. Um, now, this was during COVID, so we all had to drive in separate cars to go to a place where we were going to sit at the same table and eat. Um, and as everyone was leaving, I, I didn't know where we were going, and I didn't really know the area, so I said, hey, can somebody give me directions? Um, and one person just said, hey, don't worry about it, just follow me. So as I went and I hopped in my car, um, this person already was kind of pulling out of the driveway, and so I quickly went to follow them, but they had taken off like a rocket. And uh, when they went through a light at an intersection that was already pretty orange. By the time I got there, I had to stop. And I mean, there was no pulling off to the shoulder to wait. Uh, they were gone. You know, I, I didn't even know where I was or what the name of the restaurant was. They were my way. In the same way, you know, Jesus is saying, I am the way. You know, he's not saying, I can show you the way or tell you the way or give you instructions or directions to the way. Jesus is saying, it's only by staying in close proximity to me, by staying united with me, that you can live in the way as well. And by now, it should be obvious that when Jesus says, I'm the way, he's not talking about the way to heaven. He's talking about the way of the cross, the way of love, of selfless, sacrificial love for each other. And when Jesus says, I am the truth, again, he's not saying, I tell you the truth, you know, as if the truth were some disembodied set of facts that exist outside of Jesus that we can memorize and know. Jesus is saying, I'm the truth. You have to actually uh, stay in relationship with me uh, because I'm the truth. And again, when he says the truth, he's not saying that, you know, I'm the right answer to the question, which is the right religion or, you know, the, the trump card in some religious argument. The language of truth here is actually more like how we think of true north. You know, how like a compass needle reliably orients us to reality, even when we are disoriented. Jesus is saying that if you stay connected to me, you can actually be liberated from the, the distorted, uh, even virtual reality that most of us live in and discover real reality, a whole new reality where a cross-shaped life actually makes sense, even though it looks illogical to outsiders. You know, and when Jesus says, I am the life, he's not saying I give you life like a, a, a present you can give to somebody. You know, eternal life is not some ticket we can get from Jesus, put in our pocket and go on our merry way until we take it back out again at the pearly gates to redeem it. And Jesus is saying that it is only as you are united with me as we, as we join Christ in, in his death and we die to ourselves, our desires, our own way of living and the way of this world, that Jesus comes and by some miraculous mystery comes and lives and resides within us, breathing and living in and through us. You know, yet not I, but through Christ in me. That's how we live now, yielded and following the leadership of Jesus. This is what it means when it says that Jesus is our life. Only as we stay connected to the way, truth, and life of Jesus can we actually live in God's way and experience real reality and know the life of God coursing through our bodies. You know, this isn't about the ever after. It's about the here and now. And it's not a transaction we make with God. It's a transformation that God does in us as we follow in the way of Jesus, in the way of the cross. As we learn to lay our lives down in selfless sacrifice with him. This is where Jesus was going, to the cross. And because Jesus is the great I am, the eternally ever-present tense one who always is, who God always is, the cross is where we'll find Jesus today. And though his disciples couldn't follow him then, Jesus invites us to follow him now. 
to lay our lives down in sacrifice for our friends, for each other, for our neighbors, and for the world that God so loves. And as we do this, the glory of God will be expressed through us as a community as we put the love of Jesus on display. Now, I don't know where you're at in your life these days. Perhaps you're experiencing a difficult friendship or a stressful work situation, a crippling addiction, or maybe a broken family dynamic. And maybe as you think about it, you know, the way of the cross, the way of Jesus, um, choosing to again sacrificially love doesn't just, just doesn't feel like it makes sense, a lot of sense. It seems hopeless or like it's, it's just not the clear path forward. I know if Jesus were standing here, he would say to you, don't lose heart. Trust me. In my father's family, in my father's kingdom, there are more rooms than you can imagine. There's more possibility and opportunity than you realize. And if we will choose the way of selfless, sacrificial love, we will experience Jesus being resurrected in our lives, in our relationships, and in our community. There is hope. You know, the, the book of Acts describes the story of the early church, and it tells us that before Jesus' followers were ever called Christians, they were simply known as people who belonged to the way. You know, I wonder what it will look like for us to reclaim this kind of identity, you know, to be people who are identified as belonging to the way, belonging to Jesus, the way of, the way of love, the way of the cross, and you know, to lay our lives down sacrificially for each other so compellingly that anyone who crosses our path would encounter Jesus and find the way for themselves because of the way we love them. Now, as the band comes forward to lead us in one final song, you know, back in 2019, 42 years after Star Wars released the very first movie, the year I was born, Disney launched a brand new series in the Star Wars franchise. It was the first one to not revolve around anyone named Skywalker. Instead, it followed the life of a guy named Din Djarin, who was a Mandalorian. Now, the Mandalorians are a religious sect who follow a very strict religious code. They um, welcome in and they take in vulnerable orphans and raise them as their own. They protect each other at all costs. And they never reveal their faces. They wear masks as a way of um, identifying first as a community and not as individuals. You could say that theirs is a religion of love. And when they practice it, they look at each other and they recite a simple four-word creed to one another. They say, this is the way. This is the way. Friends, as Jesus followers, Jesus is our way. The way of Jesus, the way of love, the way of the cross. The cross is not our ticket off this planet. It is our collective pathway, our identity, our citizenship, our creed. It is the beating heart of love and it's the way that we relate to the world around us. This cross-shaped love is the true reality in which we exist and it is the blueprint for life. So Jesus invites us today to join him at the cross. And if you're willing, I invite you to repeat after me, he is the way. He is the way. Amen.